Today on Inside the Issues, Besma Mamane on revolution and change in the Middle East. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm your host, David Welch, the CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs. Every week we talk to a noted expert on some aspect of global governance uh, here at the Center for International Governance Innovation in Waterloo, Ontario. And today I'm very pleased to welcome Besma Momani, who is a, a senior fellow at CG, as well as the resident Middle Eastern expert. And she's been in great demand in the past few weeks mm -hmm. as the dramatic events in the Middle East have been unfolding. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Besma. Very thank pleased you. to have you here. Likewise. And we should let our audience know, because this is such a fast-breaking, uh, changing story, that we're actually in the studio on Wednesday afternoon, um, February the 23rd. And so if uh, viewers are watching at another time and things seem quite different from they seem to us at the moment, they will understand why. But we will do our best to try to help people make sense of a fast-changing situation. Uh, let's start by backing up a bit mm -hmm. and looking at the, at the very big picture. Why? All of a sudden, are we seeing this dramatic series of changes in what had been politically a very, very stable or at least uninteresting world for decades in most cases? Uh, why now? Well, you know, I think when Secretary Clinton said it was a perfect storm of different factors, she really had it right. Um, you know, clearly as a, a non-historian, we can't put all the pieces together, but we can make some assumptions about what's happening and try and put together a I think an explanation that's a, a thread that you know ties many of these countries together. Although there are you know particular circumstances for each country that uh, probably uh, can better explain why in this country or that. Um, in terms of the broad trends, I think clearly there is this youth bulge that people talked about. Uh, this is a demographic factor that is a little you know uh, special to the Middle East. We do have a very young population. Um, in some cases, like Egypt, 60% of the population is under the age of 30. Um, this is something that is, again, not found in other countries where we find much of our bulges in, you know, um, baby boomers, for example, and uh, perhaps in Europe similarly. Um, the Middle East is, is quite special in that sense, that much of the population is under not only the age of 15, but then also an under the age of 30. So we have this demographic group that um, is educated, uh, much of what we've seen are, are you know, students who are in university or, or newly graduated. And there's a high unemployment problem in the Middle East, partly because of this influx into the labor market of many young educated individuals. Um, again, uh, some of them are, uh, you know, from a socio-cultural perspective, frustrated. They've delayed marriage. They've delayed moving out of their parents' home for all the sort of socioeconomic pressures that they have to face. And so we have this educated mass group that is seeing very little opportunity in their countries. Add to that the sort of cronyism that happens in many of these countries where, you know, one's family name, your pedigree, uh, frankly, you know, sort of who's your connections, uh, all of these sometimes play out on who gets jobs. So in many cases, many of these young people who feel that they were the first of their class, uh, very educated and have all the qualifications to succeed in, in a system that would be one of meritocracy, find themselves without mm. much prospect and are very frustrated as a result. High expectations and they can't meet them. Absolutely. How, how much of a factor is connectedness? Uh, this isn't the most connected part of the world, but it's fairly wealthy compared to many other parts of the world. Actually, it's quite well connected uh, in terms of you know people online. Uh, in some cases, like Jordan, we have 20% of the population with computers and online in their home. Uh, in Egypt, for example, you have uh, free internet access uh, via dial-up telephone that the government has offered for about maybe 10 years now in order to stimulate a lot of people going online. The use of internet cafes is probably one of the biggest, you know, surges we've seen uh, happening in the region and a real social outlet for people. So, you know, add that combined. So you have an educated group, young people, nothing to do, sitting in an internet cafe, very cheap. One could sit there, you know, the whole day for two dollars, for example, um, and that would be the spending money that, uh, you know, a parent would give to their unemployed 24-year-old to just get out of the house. And you can see how this is a very interesting cocktail of factors that make people vent their frustration online. 
where the old guard's not watching or not keeping up. Uh, frankly, there's not a lot of monitoring online because it's generally unregulated. Uh, and so we have all these entrepreneurial bloggers. I mean, some of the Middle East bloggers are just fascinating, insightful uh, commentary about what's happening in the region. It's been, it's been like that for at least the good five, six years right now. We've seen, you know, this real uh, entrepreneurial spirit of people online. Um, that we haven't seen, you know, in other sort of previous uh, kind of young movements throughout uh, the world. Now, just a few months ago, yeah. there was, of course, a, a wave of attention paid to the fact that certain governments, not only in the Middle East, but also in the Middle East, mm -hmm. were trying especially hard to clamp down on secure communications, such yes. as the Black Brain Messenger. And in, right. in Qatar, for example, mm -hmm. the government claimed it wanted to do this to be able to um, re um, enforce morals codes, morals sure. laws. Yeah. Is there a possibility that governments had a sense that this democratic revolt was brewing and that that was actually behind some of this desire to clamp down or is that likely to be complete coincidence? I think it's a little bit of a red herring. I mean, you know, the UAE, which is one that was um, quite uh, interested in, in banning then we had Indonesia, for example, a little far away, but more using that sort of moral code argument. Saudi Arabia as well were using it you know, saying that they wanted bans on pornography, on a Blackberry, et cetera. So there are, you know, some of these kinds of movements, but I think they were, um, uh, I think they were isolated political events and not necessarily connected because uh, the governments in these countries are, you know, they don't have the kind of expertise, frankly, that the Chinese government has. They don't have the kind of technical skills where they can really put their security forces mm. on alert online. And partly this too is sort of the old mentality. We can see this even playing out in how they've responded to many of these movements. There's a very old sort of typical sort of security kind of apparatus mentality of, you know, troops on the ground that, um, you know, undercover police. I mean, this old system of mukhabarat is this, you know, intelligence circle that, you know, has their eyes and ears open, you know, through uh, putting fear in society um, and really kind of, you know, scaring people into not talking. But they weren't able to really do that online. They don't have, frankly, the technical expertise to do it, um, nor so the civil skill. society was relatively strong compared to, for example, in China. I mean, online. I online. mean, the really interesting thing here is that, you know, civil society on the ground has always had difficulty in the Middle East. But when you came to the online, there's just this, it was really the unregulated information highway that allowed people to collaborate. And, you know, something like Facebook, uh, which is, is a mandatory part of a young person's identity in the Middle East, um, is really taking off as a way of expressing oneself. Now, why did we not see this coming? We like to think that mm -hmm. if we understand the world, we can anticipate important changes. But once again, we find ourselves failing to see a dramatic, possibly world-changing series of events. What, what were we missing when we were looking at this part of the world? I mean, I guess as a political scientist, I think uh, perhaps, you know, sort of the tools that we've, you know, so grown uh, accustomed to are things like state analysis and thinking of, you know, civil society actors. The concept of sort of this, you know, leaderless movement, um, you know, something that could be organized online, it, it really, I don't, I'm amazed to say, but it really didn't occur to us. We're not used to that kind of analysis. You know, how do you get your hands on something that's as, you know, dispersed as Facebook? I mean, you know, mm. it, it's really a new sort of conceptual tool that, that we are not used to as analysts, really. Well, we'll have to rethink our conceptual yeah. toolkit. Yeah. We'll be back again in just a minute with Basma Mamani. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Uh, let's stick with this uh, context setting for a minute. So you mentioned the demographic uh, factors, the technological factors. Was there an economic angle to what we're seeing unfolding in the Middle East now? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've had economic liberalization in the Middle East for about, you know, 15 years, starting um, way back in, in the late 1990s. And we've seen it really culminate more recently into a lot of investment uh, into um, uh, real estate development, in particular petrodollars that, uh, you know, were awash, so to speak, in, in the late or oh, sorry, mid to 2000s up until 2008 when prices were about $140 a barrel. We had a lot of petrodollars that were not finding their way into the United States and, and Western Europe, partly because of sort of many 
uh, oil uh, producing states were afraid that their assets would be confiscated as sort of post 9-11 you know witch hunts on their assets so we saw the Dubai ports controversy for example so much of that fund started to go into the Middle East they were ripe for foreign direct investment you know they had the right regulatory environment so to speak but because of the negative neighborhood effect many investors didn't go there and now we had you know Gulf investors which are a little less spooked by the political realities of the region investing into the country. And what's really interesting is that we start to see, you know, great urban developments of, of uh, you know, mega towers and, and tourist resorts and uh, shopping malls, etc. And part of that type of economic development is that we saw some really good indicators coming out of these countries. So one of the things that, you know, many analysts were, were kind of um, you know, stumped by was here is a country like Egypt, which is 5% GDP growth per year. Uh, Tunisia similarly was recording similar amounts. I mean, what explains, you know, uprising in these countries that are doing well? Particularly when investors usually stay away from places that they exactly. see as politically unstable. Exactly. So does this mean the investors just weren't bright? Well, no, the investors were bright, but they wanted real estate. They wanted, and part of, you know, what I've personally written about is this sort of reincarnating the Dubai model, right? So they saw Amman, they saw Cairo as, you know, reincarnation of the Dubai model. And anyone who visited these cities in the past four or five years is just inundated with brand new mega projects of a scale that many locals can't afford, but were really geared towards foreign investors. And what I've been, you know, arguing about, or arguing in my work on this, is that this has created this sort of social enemy in many ways. I mean, you can imagine the youth frustration. Not only are they, you know, unemployed, but now you have all these marvels of what should be Western development, you know, shopping malls where many youth still conglomerate, but can never afford to buy anything in mm. there, so they just sort of you know, pollute the, the mall. Yeah. I mean, you know, so you start to get this, you know, societal circumstance where there's a lot of inequality, so the GD coefficient is widening in many cases for these societies, and the economic liberalization that many had hoped would trickle down was really dumped into a lot of fixed assets that people on the ground uh, were not really getting their hands on. So, so investors lost their fear, but why would the people lose yeah. their fear of their own governments? Well, this is fascinating. I mean, that really is, I think, the one thing that thread, you know, the thread that we're looking for among many of them is this, you know, that, that rulers should fear us, not us fear them. And this is something that has never existed in the Middle East. I mean, the sort of intelligence service has always had such a firm grip on society that people uh, didn't utter the, you know, the, the person's name, the leader's name in most cases. So we always talked about in Egypt, you know, the pharaoh. He was never, you didn't utter his name. You always referred to him hmm. in this sort of, you know, obscure image. Cryptic way. Yeah. yeah. And now it's, you know, no, they're accountable to us. You know, so the, the demonstrations throughout the Middle East today are, you know, to the leader, we have a right, you know, to question you. Um, and we're seeing even in places where uh, the, the leaders aren't necessarily being targeted. We're seeing in many uh, organizations and companies, you know, little small scale demonstrations. You know, there's a friend that I spoke to in the Middle East this morning said, you know, outside, you know, there was this bread factory and I just noticed there's 15 people workers saying, you know, down with the boss. I mean, it's sort of this new sort of accountability, you know, that is being required or asked yeah. of all these leaders that never existed before. It was always very muzzled and now all of a sudden that, you know, fear is broken down. Is it fair to call this westernization? You know what, I think one of the things that is so beautiful about this and what again adds the authenticity of this is that it has no Western involvement, right? I mean, one of the things that makes this, and I think it's a contributing factor, uh, very frankly, uh, to much of these movements is the fact that they're organic and legitimate. And no one can, you know, come out with the big stick and say, oh, you know, this is a Western imposition, you know. So, so when Muammar Gaddafi comes on television two nights ago and says something like, oh, these are all American, you know, led youth who have been drugged, I mean, people just laugh, mm. you know, because that's ridiculous. Uh, you know, this is really an organic, legitimate movement. But we and think so, of things like, you know, grassroots democracy movements right. or the idea that rulers are accountable to the people. We like to think of those as Western ideas. Yeah. Maybe that's not entirely fair, but yeah. uh, maybe it's true that mm. sort of Western values are beginning to spread into this part of the world, and it's a part of the world that I think a lot of us thought was immune yeah. to these values. I mean, I think the one, you know, sort of, if we could sort of find 
a set of core values that people aspire to. Things like meritocracy, absolutely, if you want to call that a Weberian, a Western kind of uh, um, value system, absolutely. Uh, people want meritocracy. You know, there's, there's nothing more destructive to a society than having corruption um, so embedded. Um, it's a very frustrating experience, um, as anybody can imagine, to deal with that on every level of, of the social strata. So, I think that there are some of these values, and, and I don't know if they're Western, they may be universal human rights values, I think, in many ways. I mean, I think we all, uh, from uh, inception, want to be in a, in a society where we are appreciated for our, our good work and hard deeds. And, and again, one of the things that many people forget about the Middle East is how educated it is. Right. You know, we sort of have mental, I, I call this a mental trap, uh, for many of us in Canada, particularly, you know, with Afghanistan, we sort of imagine that the Afghanistan, uh, you know, the the epitome of what is a failed, you know, or failed state. Um, that's not the case in the Middle East. Uh, very educated uh, girls outnumber boys in uh, you know secondary school education and post-secondary school education. There's no sort of gender um, uh, barrier for women in education. Um, this is not a repressed society in the sense of many of the other sort of negative stereotypes that we have. Um, so the fact that this is an educated society that just wants to be valued uh, and has something to say of value is something that I think is, a, is, is part of that cultural uh, wave or, or system that is finally making its way into the youth and, and they're demanding for that you know, kind of dignity that we've never seen before. One of the interesting aspects of these movements is that they don't appear to be religious. They don't seem to be Islamicist. Yeah. Now, I suppose the jury's still out and Islamicists may down the road succeed mm -hmm. in capturing some of these movements, right. but uh, have we completely misgaged the strength of Islamic feeling in this part of the world, at least among the youth. Why is this so surprisingly oh, secular? I mean, you know what, I think that, you know, the, um, the ideological underpinning of Islamists is definitely um, um, a thing of the past. You know, this was, you know, the, the 1970s, the 1980s kind of rhetoric. This is not the rhetoric of today among the young people. Um, you know, it used to be the boogeyman of many of these autocratic regimes was to say, well, if it's not us, the Islamists will come. And here come the youth and say, you know what, we don't want you or the Islamists. I mean, that's the old system, that's the old guard, that's the old paradigm uh, of ideological options, and we don't want either of them. So I think that they're, they're not interested. Um, in, in, in absorbing Islamist ideology. They want secular states. Indeed, they'll be conservative. I mean, one cannot, you know, escape from that. These are conservative societies. But, you know, Islam as sort of a theocracy, uh, no one looks to that in many of these movements as anything more than, uh, you know, a terrible path to go down. Absolutely fascinating. Well, we'll, we'll be back again in just a minute with Basma Mamani. Uh, you're watching or listening to Inside the Issues a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Uh, Bespa, you mentioned earlier in the uh, broadcast that there were country-specific mm -hmm. factors at play here. So let's talk a bit about some of the individual countries and the changes we've been seeing. It all started in Tunisia, yeah. which I think must have been a great surprise to a lot of people because Tunisia, frankly, wasn't on our radar screen. Absolutely. What explains for the the fire starting there and spreading so rapidly from there? Yeah. Any insights? Well, obviously, a lot of people looking at this uh, young man that uh, you know put himself on fire, set himself ablaze. Um, he was a university graduate who, um, you know, after not being able to find a job, eventually had a vegetable stand or a fruit stand, and then eventually the police came and started asking him for a permit, basically looking for a bribe, and he couldn't afford the bribe. And uh, out of sheer desperation from, you know, such high expectation to being demeaned in such a way, put himself ablaze. I mean, that, uh, that was the... the uh, well, it touched a chord, didn't it? It absolutely did, because there are many young people throughout the Middle East who feel as frustrated as that. And, and where, again, the key word dignity, you know, we see this in placards throughout Tahrir Square or other places in the Middle East. You know, this is about dignity, educated people who want an opportunity um, to, to, uh, to show themselves, and, and they're, not, uh, they're not able to shine. Right, and it spread from Tunisia to Egypt. Yeah. And in both of those cases, these were regimes with reputations for you know, being brutal in their crackdown on opposition and dissent, and yet in neither case did we see an effective response from the regimes? Mm -hmm. How do we account for that? Well, I think in both the Tunisia and Egypt's case, the fact that the army 
are a conscription-based army that actually draws from the masses. And the masses understand the sorrow and the frustration of the average person. Um, you know, the military is uh, underpaid in many of these countries. Um, they, they barely can, you know, create a, a very decent living. Um, so in many ways, they are of the people who understand uh, the frustration of the average person. Um, you know, I think the thing in, in Tunisia um, that was really interesting here is that also there's a strong diasporic, diaspora, uh, diasporic <laughs> community with uh, many European countries. And so that kind of cultural interchange is really important. There's right. a brain drain happening in Tunisia as a result, Egypt as well. You know, many of the most talented individuals leave the country. Um, and so, and, and when they come back, you know, one of the things, for example, Wael Ghanim, who was the Google executive that returned from Dubai, for example, to come back and start this movement in Egypt is emblematic of that kind of generation where, again, you know, his country couldn't appreciate his skills and talent and had to go elsewhere, but is vowing to come back to Egypt to, to start something, um, which he did. And so there's also this sort of, you know, I've seen where things work. You know, I've been elsewhere and, and this could be a great country, but we are being held back by, by you know, individuals and corrupt regimes. Um, in the case of Egypt, um, you know, this was an opposition that had been underground for well over a year. Um, so it didn't just pop on the, on the stage. In fact, uh, it has its origins in being called the April 6th movement because they had tried a year earlier a similar kind of uprising. But what's very interesting is that they were crushed very quickly. And what they did this time was try to take some of the, you know, Che Guevara's, uh, you know, uh, small cell, you know, uh, kind of uprising models and basically uh, create this system across the city, very organized, you know, a lot, again, online, uh, you know, beyond the reach of the eyes and ears of, of the Mukhabarat or the intelligence service, and basically organized themselves in these little clusters till they finally made their way towards the epicenter of the city, which is Tahrir Square. And the way they were evading the security system was really quite intelligent. They had, you know, plaque tactics where you know, your groups of 10 and the leader was not supposed to know where the next cell was. I mean, unbelievable kind of uh, organization and planning. But this was a movement that was really in the works for a very long time. Mm. And the regime in Egypt had a very interesting response. At least Hosni Mubarak's mm -hmm. response was very interesting. He initially defiant, um, seemed to be hoping and pretending it would all go away relatively quickly. When it wasn't going away, sort of minimal concession, mm -hmm. the next day, another minimal concession. So attempting to sort of solve the problem by doing as little as possible in the way of change was the playbook, yeah. and yet it seemed to sort of feed the feeding frenzy on the part of the, the uh, popular revolt. So that the more people Absolutely. sensed a willingness to change, the more strident they became in their demands for change, and the less willing they were to compromise with their own regime. Absolutely. Now we're seeing the same thing happening in Bahrain, right? Yeah. And we're seeing just today, the Saudi regime is sort of anticipatorily beginning mm -hmm. to make certain concessions toward mm -hmm. the people. And in Jordan, again, the king is anticipatorily making concessions. Why are people following the same playbook that so obviously failed in the Egyptian case in these other countries? Is it for want of lack of alternatives? Is it all they can imagine by way of response? You know, I think if, if I could play psychoanalyst just trying to, you know, hear what Gaddafi was saying a few days ago, um, was this sheer disbelief in his, his even though it was quite eccentric, um, speech that they, this young group of people could bring me down. I mean, there is this sheer disbelief in the mass movement. Um, and, you know, the Mubarak speeches, for example, were extremely patronizing. I mean, they were, you know, condescending in every sense of the word, tone, uh, scope, um, everything from, you know, uh, Omar Suleiman, who was his VP, uh, at one point saying, uh, you know, we're going to call the parents and tell them to go pick up their kids from the square. I mean, this sort of, you know, these are just little young hooligans kind of thing is something that uh, many of these leaders are not grasping that mm. this is no longer just young kids that you can, you know, uh, quiet with little tokens of, of uh, uh, reform and change that don't mean much. Um, they're two, three steps behind the mass 
you know, movement and what they're asking for. And I think that now that we've seen several regimes, you know, that seemed like they would never leave, uh, Mubarak in particular, uh, come down, uh, people are emboldened, absolutely. And we're going to see a lot more of the kind of, you know, kind of, you know, what are you going to do for us as opposed to, you know, us doing something for you. We're going to really see a change in, I think, the game coming forward. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about Libya in a moment because that's the, uh, the country where the action is happening most today. Yep. Uh, we'll be right back to chat a bit more about that. Uh, you're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org on Facebook, on YouTube, or on Twitter. Welcome back. Besma, you mentioned Libya a moment ago. Now, Libya, of course, is the exception to what I was saying about the you know, minimal concession strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, Muammar Gaddafi has essentially attempted to make no concessions of any kind. Uh, it's not working out terribly well for him either. Now, in Libya, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to be the case that we're seeing uh, political loyalties devolve mm -hmm. to tribal levels of identity, so that the supporters of the regime are essentially Gaddafi's own tribe members. Yes. And they're mounting what seems to be a, a slightly effective response to the uprising in those parts of the country where um, Gaddafi's tribe is strong. Yes. But in the East, where his tribe is weak, mm -hmm. uh, very ineffectual. We didn't see that in Egypt. It, there weren't tribal responses. There was, it was really a nationalist right. response. Right. Uh, so I guess we have to understand the different countries yes. differently in terms of this, this, the political culture and the sociology, Absolutely. don't we? Um, Egypt does not have tribes. Right. Um, so you know, simply it, it doesn't exist. Uh, you know, in tribes in the Middle East, I think one to, you know, just to caution um, our mental images of what a tribe is, really they're extended families. I mean, they're people right. with the exact same last name who tended to live clustered in the same villages or in the same towns um, and have shared kinship, definitely. Uh, but they're no more than just a, a very close-knit family that's, you know, usually in the same locale. Um, in the case of, of Libya, uh, there are many tribes in the country. And what makes it even more difficult, I think, is that it's also segmented you know, among the have and have nots. And so what we have here, for example, in uh, Benghazi, in the um, east part of the country, uh, they have the oil wealth. Um, this is a particular um, um, society or tribal uh, system um, that had at one point um, uh, wanted independence before uh, before Gaddafi came into power. Whereas Gaddafi and his tribe, the Gaddaf, come from Tripoli, from the west part of the country, and they don't have oil. And so part of, you can understand the reasoning, and something that Saif al-Islam, uh, Gaddafi's son, had actually quite frankly said it, you know, to his, his compatriots in, in, in Tripoli, um, you know, what's going to happen when the Americans come in here? I mean, part of that was the scare tactic, but they're going to segment us like Iraq. Um, they're going to make sure that the oil of Benghazi does not come to uh, Tripoli, and then we're going to have nothing. And so there is a new element, you know, here where the resource uh, rich part of the country um, is one that is probably most opposed to um, um, Gaddafi, partly because, he, because Gaddafi had stacked many people from his own tribe into uh, many high-ranking parts of the government, and the uh, tribes in the uh, Benghazi area had been repressed for a very long time. Um, so that brings a, you know, a different element to the situation, and we might see that kind of tribal divisions play out uh, that we hadn't seen in Egypt or Tunisia. Now we do have tribes in Jordan, so yes. there's a potential for a tribal um, drawing of battle lines there. In uh, Bahrain, it's really Sunni and Shia, isn't it? It's a different constellation of domestic structures. Yeah, absolutely. In Bahrain, the rulers are a Sunni monarchy. Uh, Al-Khalfan, um, that have very close ties, in fact, kinship ties to the Saudi monarchy. Uh, and so they have always sort of depended on the Saudi monarch for support, whereas the vast majority of the population have their roots in actually Persia, are Shiite, um, and many of them have been complaining for many years of being disenfranchised, even though there is a, um, a sort of sham parliamentary system there right now. Um, they have been banned, their parties have been banned from participating in, par in parliamentary elections. And so we see a sort of gerrymandering as well as a real big problem in Bahrain. Uh, we do see this uh, slowly stripping uh, the Shiite population, the majority, of many rights that 
you know, cities in the country enjoy. Uh, also, the government, one of the things it's quite, um, um, it's been criticized quite a bit for, is for importing or, or allowing many Sunni uh, area residents to come into the country and get citizenship to try and, and change the demographic balance in the country. So these are all sort of long-standing issues, again, some of which is sectarian. Uh, I think that um, there is some hope for Bahrain in that because there is a possibility for negotiations and compromise, uh, we might just see this one perhaps uh, resolve in, in that, you know, the, the test will be in the next few days as uh, groups meet, uh, that we are going to see some sort of more negotiated solution to this. Do you have a sense of how Iran may play out in this drama? Yeah. Um, I, I imagine the authorities in Iran are supporting the Shia opposition in Bahrain, but at the same time we've also seen street demonstrations in yes. Tehran. Well, it's fascinating because Ahmadinejad went on radio today or television saying that all people have the right to demonstrate and that, you know, uh, governments don't have the right to muzzle their opposition, which is just absolutely farcical seeing what's happened with the Green Movement for, you know, a number of years now, uh, which he's done the exact same thing, actually muzzle them quite brutally. And so I think that uh, uh, as these movements have no stamp of Islamist uh, behind them. This is, you know, a, a secular movement. Clearly, uh, every Egyptian in the street, for example, where there was so much fear of Muslim Brotherhood, um, has made it very clear this is a secularist movement, uh, has dispelled any sort of myth out there that this is the Brotherhood coming to take over. And so it's pulled the rug under uh, Ahmadinejad to take any credit for this, which he tried in the very early days, as, as you might remember. So Ahmadinejad really is going to lose out any sort of moral support that he thought he was getting from the Arab streets as a discredited uh, leader. And I think the pressure uh, on Iran to, to change will start to mount as he has very little credibility mm -hmm. uh, moving forward. Now, so far, we in the West have been fairly hands off. Yes. We've, we've let things play out. Mm -hmm. um, that's uncharacteristic. I imagine you probably think that's wise. I think so. Probably not much we can do. You know, Hard to I stage manage or yeah. damage you know, control. This is probably the, you know, the, the, narr the narrative of this story or the history books will have a very, you know, uh, legitimate, authentic movement behind this. And I think the, for all the criticism of many who will, you know, ask the Americans to come in or they didn't say too much or et cetera, I think that really they have handled this very well, uh, being very calculative and knowing when to talk, when not to talk. Uh, they've used backroom channels. In the case of Egypt, we know that there was a very strict sort of, uh, uh, you know, ultimatum to the Egyptian military that finally saw them overthrow uh, through a very bloodless coup d'etat of, of Mubarak, which was great for the Egyptian people. And uh, similarly, there may be similar kinds of movement behind the scenes in the case of Bahrain, where the U.S. Fifth Fleet is stationed and where there's a lot of, there's a free trade agreement with the Bahrainis. The Americans have a free trade with them. There's a lot of channels of mm -hmm. backroom conversations that is appropriate. But at the moment, the fact that the optics of this is non-Western, it pulls again the rug from under people like Ahmadinejad and others right. who want to put a stamp on this as being a Western movement, which it clearly is not. Well, absolutely fascinating. And thank you so much for coming in and helping okay. us understand it. Uh, with your permission, I may ask you to come back in a few weeks and we'll uh, continue the conversation because there's obviously a lot more to say. And I'm sure a very great deal will happen in the meantime. Okay. And I hope the audience will join us again then, as every week. Um, this is Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Please look for us at cgonline.org on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube.